Uh, last week we called to your attention the peculiar circumstances which contributed to the rise of Neoplatonism in North Africa, Athens, and Rome. To very briefly summarize this situation, in order that we may use it as a further springboard, we must remember that this sect came into existence almost at the very time of the decline and decay of three great empires. Uh, we are inclined to think of these changes as affecting only political units. But as H.G. Wells so well pointed out, there is no great political change that does not profoundly affect the status of the individual. And although we do not always have an adequate account of the reaction upon private citizens, this reaction must be regarded as profound. And so we have a great school of philosophy, essentially mystical, rising out of the ashes of the three great empires. And as has always been observed, in the descent of human institutions, there is an inevitable revulsion away from materialism whenever we have a marked decline in political conditions. As uncertainties increase, wars multiply, private problems mount, the individual turns inevitably to the consolation of his spiritual convictions. And as many historians and the literature of the time points out, the decline of these empires did not mean the total extinction of idealists. It did not mean that all Romans were corrupt, all Grecians decadent, or all Egyptians reactionaries. These large generalities cannot safely be applied to any group of human beings because each individual has a nature of his own and may be an exception to any rule by which we seek to capture or define him. And we have ample evidence at this time, for example, of the rise of a group of powerful idealistic institutions representing a desperate effort on the part of human beings themselves to meet the emergency in which they found themselves. And, of course, prominent among these groups were those in Syria and the Lebanon, the Essenes, the Jonanites, the Therapeutae, and uh, the groups of the Semitic schools and colonies in Egypt uh, under the leadership of men like Philo Judaeus. We also have the tremendous rise of Gnosticism, in Syria under Simon Magus, and in Egypt under Basilides. We find the rise of a great restoration of learning in Greece under the ample leadership of Proclus, who has been called the Platonic successor. And in Rome, Plotinus, probably one of the most outstanding men of his time. I've told you many things about Plotinus, and I think perhaps you all know the story which perhaps best typifies his life. He lived in a decadent period of Roman history. He lived as the tutor and teacher of children. And uh, whatever we may think of the Romans in those days of the debauched Caesars, we must recognize that they also seem to have realized the importance of honest men. For many Roman families, left their entire estates under the trusteeship of Plotinus. At one time he is said to have held most of the wealth of the patrician class of Rome in his own hands, not for his own use, but because he was the executor of estates. Also, in those days when men's lives were uncertain, many approached him and asked him to accept the guardianship of their children if any evil befell them and it often befell. And during the closing years of his life, it is said that Plotinus lived in the atmosphere of a kindergarten, 
that there were dozens of young people, hundreds in fact, under his care, that he worked with each one of them, that he assisted the young women with two proper marriages and homes, that he established the young men in business, and that through his busy life of philosophy, he was never for a moment hesitant in turning his attentions to the needs of a nursing infant. And yet this man has survived to us as probably one of the most stupendous intellects of his time, yet known in his own day as one of the kindliest and most simple persons who ever lived. So in even these discordant and difficult periods, there was much true greatness, and much of it centered in the great rise of Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism, let us remember, was separated from the historical school of Plato by over 400 years. It also was deeply concerned with the Pythagorean problems, from which it was separated by better than 600 years. Thus, Neoplatonism cannot be said to be merely Platonism restated. Neoplatonism was an interpretation, based certainly upon Platonic principles, but adapted to the needs of a different type of world from the one that Plato ever knew. A world which had a great deal of sadness in it, a world despondent with the weight of its own worldliness, a disillusioned, almost neurotic world, a world that had lost its securities, a world in which the private citizen was no longer able to count his blessings or to determine with reasonable certainty his own daily future. Thus in these times, the great descent of the Platonic tradition uh, served as a powerful instrument, uh, as has been pointed out by many historians, in preserving a certain measure of calmness, a certain measure of detached thoughtfulness toward life, which might otherwise have almost totally ceased in the pandemonium which finally ended in the great invasions by the Goths, the Visigoths, and the uh, tremendous and powerful campaigns of Attila. So Neoplatonism was more than just a philosophy. It was the heart and soul of the people in great sorrow, reaching out to the best solution that they knew, and taking that solution and interpreting it according to their immediate, pressing, spiritual, moral, and ethical needs. As one of the writers of the period points out, it was the uh, doctrine which for many people, for many sincere persons, kept dream and hope alive, made it possible to face a universe which seemed terrible, but which had to be understood, and through understanding, man again restored his faith in both God and his fellow man. Now, as we've also said, the Neoplatonic school flourished in three general areas, Athens, Rome, and Alexandria. And uh, it also, to a certain degree, spread through the entire Mediterranean area and through a good part of the Aegean area. And in the course of its unfolding, it gives to us another interesting name in connection with the descent of philosophy, and that is Iamblichus. He was a Syrian, born in what we would term today the Holy Land. And he was early under the influence of Porphyry, Plotinus, and other members of the Neoplatonic school. We do not know the exact date of the death of the birth of Iamblichus, but he died A.D. 330. Thus he belongs in the latter part of the 3rd and the first part of the 4th century. He preceded Proclus, who mentions him in his own writings, and follows after the great masters of the first Neoplatonic revival. Of Amplicus himself, we have very little information. Probably the most that we can ever know of a person of this kind is to be derived from the tone and quality of his work. As a person, he is indistinct. Uh, as a character, as a temperament, as an individual, he is rather powerfully delineated. Uh, Amplicus was by no means the most brilliant of the Neoplatonists. That he was a serious and uh, sober scholar, we know. That he was a man of great personal piety, we can also rather quickly uh, apperceive from his work. In his life and in his thinking, devotion dominated. And while, as was natural in those days, 
in which there was no essential div division between religion and philosophy. Uh, there is not a clear line of demarcation in his thinking. We can see that everything he touched, he handled with a, a peculiar and wonderful mystical reverence. He was never satisfied merely to approach things on an intellectual level. He had to go beyond this. Therefore, his name is particularly associated with one step or degree of the Neoplatonic ladder of development. I explained that ladder in general to you last week, rising from opinion uh, through all the different degrees of intellect, and finally uh, culminating or terminating at the upper end in theurgy. Uh, Iamblichus was one of the principal exponents of this mystery of theurgy, uh, which has been likened by some Westerners uh, to Grecian yoga. But this is not actually a proper definition. It indicates a lack of a critical uh, consideration. Because actually, while both of these disciplines seek a certain kind of spiritual exaltation, the concept of yoga and of the uh, Neoplatonic theurgy, uh, these concepts are essentially different. Of course, there is one point that I think that we have to recognize in both schools, however, and that is that when we use the term, either in India or in Greece, of spiritual exaltation or the elevation of a spiritual condition, uh, it is not to be interpreted in the sense or a meaning, in any sense of the word, personal aggrandizement. Because to them, all elevation, both in the East and West, was departure from personality toward universality. Therefore, no individual who attend, as attained to a high state could possibly establish the concept of personal possession of wisdom or knowledge. The entire concept, both of yoga and theurgy, is that the more the individual ascends, the more completely he recognizes the identity of life, the identity of the human need, and his own exceedingly humble place as a servant of common good. Therefore, ascent does not mean vain glory or self-aggrandizement. Ascent means the actual attainment of a level of internal realization in which the self is no longer important. This is clearly pointed out in no uncertain words by the Neoplatonists and also is to be found in practically every ancient Oriental work dealing with the yogic or Vedantic disciplines. Now, the urge becomes so important uh, to Iamblichus, that he devoted a very great part of his writing to this consideration. He had a school which was reasonably strong, but did not survive very long because all of Neoplatonism was gradually entering into a period of, of fierce persecution from which it did not survive as a sect. Although it did survive in many respects to dominate practically every system of idealistic thinking from its own time to Ralph Waldo Emerson. <coughs> In the Neoplatonic uh, group founded by Amblichus were a number of fairly brilliant scholars, and there is still some question today as to which one of these, or if all of them together, uh, united to produce the text which we are interested in this evening. Its ancient title, as it first appeared in known manuscripts and in the first incunabular printings, is Iamblichus on the Mysteries of the Egyptians. Now this term would imply, apparently, uh, that the work was by Iamblichus. Uh, here again, however, there seems to be a certain amount of historical doubt. Whether it was his own work, or whether it was compiled like the so-called Golden Verses of Pythagoras, we do not know. But certainly we do know from his other writings that it represents him, that it represents the attitudes, opinions, and beliefs which he held. And as uh, it takes form and develops before us, it becomes impersonalized almost on the title page of it. Here is the first edition of the work in English uh, from the translation of Mr. Thomas Taylor, probably one of the outstanding uh, commentators and translators of Greek and classical thought of his time. And in this we find a great deal of interest in interesting information uh, at the beginning of the work. 
we find, for example, that the book is held to be the result of a correspondence between a Greek philosopher and an Egyptian scholar. And therefore, we have the following description uh, below the title. The answer of the preceptor, Abamon, to the epistle of Porphyry to Anemo, resolving certain doubts. And uh, these doubts, uh, evidently relate as the work unfolds to the technique or theory of thi or theurgy or the mystery of the union of human consciousness with the divine. The entire work then is related uh, directly or indirectly to the Egyptian system as it was after the collapse of the Greco-Egyptian uh, religious culture and after Egypt had become a vassal state of the Roman Empire. So we must pause for just a moment here to introduce another interesting motion which is discernible at this time. Somewhere, perhaps as early as the first century, certainly not later than the fourth or fifth AD, there arose in Egypt a school which is called the Hermetic. Now, the Hermetists claimed, of course, a great antiquity to their doctrine and belief. But no text or no works dealing with the Hermetic mystery, uh, no work is known prior to the early centuries of the Christian era. Like many other mysterious organizations, it seems to have assumed an antiquity or to have been based upon older records, beliefs, or traditions, but as a formal group seems to have risen about the same time as the Gnostics, uh, the Kabbalists in the Syrian area, the Neoplatonists, and uh, the Essenes and other mystical sects. Uh, the Hermetists represent, therefore, a last statement, and to a degree a purification or attempt to regenerate and redeem the great gradually vanishing system of Egyptian religion. Now we know, for example, that the Egyptian religion flourished almost undiminished in grandeur and glory for nearly 5,000 years. And from the earliest texts that we have, many of which go back 4,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era, the system was already highly evolved and highly instituted. We must also realize that in the early periods of Egyptian religion, uh, the faith was an extremely democratic system. In other words, there was no such a thing as a formal religion of Egypt. We have to use a term, Egyptian religion, but it actually carries a consideration of probably 30 or 40 different faiths united into a grand pattern. But these faiths, each with an individual and distinct structure, the great common denominator of these faiths was in the person of the Pharaoh, who as priest-king presided over all the gnomes or provinces of Egypt, and was to a measure the hierophant of all their mysteries. But with this general overshadowing uh, concept, the religions of the provinces and states of Egypt were very largely local. And during the comparatively early period of this development, deities began to take shape in the gnomes or provinces. At one time, for example, Amun-Re, who later became the supreme solar deity of Egypt, was merely the god of a very small province. Uh, the rise of the Osirian cult uh, was comparatively late in Egyptian religion. And in its early development, Osiris was also a local community deity, not known outside of a very restricted era, uh, area. The same was true of the mysterious deity Thoth. Thoth, the god of the writing table, seems to have been partly derived from the earlier Assyrian, Chaldean, and Babylonian concept, which was summarized in the deity Nebo. Nebo, uh, there is a, a statue of him in the British Museum. On the base of the statue are these words. What has been, will be. I am Nebo, 
lord of the writing table. Nebo was the keeper of the records. He was the uh, wise historian, chronicler, scribe of the gods. He was also an intellectual deity, ruling mind and thought. And he was the one who recorded all of the wisdom and wonder of the universe. Gradually, in the rise of the Assyrian Chaldean complex, therefore, Nebo became identified with the principle of mind, because he was the mind of the gods. He was their messenger, he was their friend. But he also took upon himself various attributes, and as the divine mind, he descended to earth, took form, and taught men. Therefore he brought the wisdom of the gods to men and gained a great distinction as the messenger or manifestor of the divine will. He was the beloved son of the father God and was therefore an intercessor uh, between gods and men. We find this in the ancient cuneiform tables in the British Museum and in other ancient uh, monuments and repositories. Nebo, in some of his attributes, uh, gradually moved toward one of the lesser gnomes or provinces of Egypt on the Chaldean side of the country, and by degrees insinuated his, himself through his worship uh, into many other areas, until gradually, by the time of the great recension, which resulted in the rise of a more or less codified Egyptian religion, he emerged in the full uh, glory of Thoth, the ibis head, or the deity who was the scribe and the recorder of the gods, represented with the stylus and the waxen tablet. Thoth was therefore, uh, in turn, identified with the principle of wisdom. And as wisdom, and as the scribe of the gods, as their messenger, as the <coughs> ambassador of the deities, uh, to various parts of the world, uh, he gradually came to the notice of the Greeks, who found him exceedingly similar to one of their own divinities. When the uh, Greek hierarchy of Pharaohs took over in Egypt under the Ptolemies, and under the splendid court of Ptolemy Philadelphus, uh, the Greco-Egyptian complex of religion began to emerge and take particular form. And in this period there arose several deities that had previously been comparatively local, but because of their similarities or parallels with Greek gods, uh, became more and more intriguing and interesting to the Greek uh, hierarchy and the Greek principalities that arose in Egypt. These deities were, in uh, more or less in order of importance, both Osiris, Isis, and Serapis. All of these deities show a, a very strong later uh, Grecian influence. Of course, all of them were worshipped earlier, but usually not in the same way, or with the same legends, or with the same interpretation. Uh, the uh, nearest to being an exception to this would be Isis, who was worshipped in much, old, in much uh, larger areas at an earlier date. But the great Osirian Isis and the cycle of legends which surrounded her in connection with Hermes and Serapis were of comparatively late date, but she flourished um, greatly in the last years, last centuries of the Egyptian religion. In the transition from Greece to Egypt of certain philosophical doctrines, possibly post-Pythagorean, uh, there is the transition between both and Thoth Hermes, and little by little the Egyptian Thoth came to be known even in Egypt as Hermes. As Hermes, he was still essentially the scribe in the Book of the Dead. He was still the messenger and writer of the gods. He was still the mediator between the gods and mankind. But by the time we come to the cycle covered by our story this evening of Iamblichus, and his work on the mysteries. Hermes had come forward and had eclipsed Isis and Osiris and Serapis. Hermes had become the principal patron of the late Egyptian restoration. 
And gradually from this circumstance there arose a new sect, which is called the Hermetists. Now, many persons think that the Hermetic philosophers were essentially alchemists. In the chemical sense of the term, this is not so. Uh, the original Hermetic teachings were very much closer to the Gnostic and the Essene. And the divine Pyramander, the shepherd of men, and the great dialogues and discourses of Hermes uh, constitute a literature highly mystical, with a considerable amount of Gnostic and Neoplatonic influence, and also with borrowings obviously from the Kabbalah and quite possibly from the Far East, because your caravan routes were functioning at that time. The Hermetic Mysteries, as we recognize them at this point, therefore, were highly philosophical, highly metaphysical. They related primarily uh, to the regeneration of man and approached the subject very much on the same level as the Neoplatonists. The Neoplatonists uh, mingled considerably with the Hermetic philosophers, and it is interesting to note that in the rise of the Christian Church, which followed within two or three centuries of this date, that the only early pagans or neo-pagans that have been held in high esteem by the Church and were never publicly attacked or defamed by the Church, but were regarded as legitimate uh, predecessors of the church philosophy were Plato, Hermes, and the small original group of Neoplatonists. Uh, these individuals were given particular consideration perhaps because St. Augustine of Hippo, who was one of the first codifiers of Roman law under the uh, Holy Roman Empire, was himself strongly addicted to these sects. In any event, the Hermetic teachings drifted into the early works of the Nicene and post-Nicene Fathers, and there is very little conflict. In fact, uh, these and the Platonic works were accepted almost without question, and contributed very largely to the uh, modification and structure of the early Church. This is not speculation. The anti-Nicene Fathers themselves explicitly state that this is so. And writing in the first and second centuries, they should be in a reasonable position to know. Uh, this particular point then brings us now to the involvement of Hermes in this particular work. It begins with a sentence relating to Hermes in which the preceptor Abamon, the Egyptian, explains that the wisdom which is herein contained, and now he is following the Hermetic story almost exactly, uh, may be traced, or was traceable, to Hermes, the god who presided over language, and was formerly very properly considered as common to all the priests. Uh, he explains, for example, that the wisdom which he is going to unfold in this study of the mysteries is based upon the Hermetic pillars, which were probably buried or hidden under the temple of Sais uh, in Egypt. Uh, where Absalom claimed to have seen them uh, as a result of a trip through a subterranean lake to an island under the earth, where the two pillars of Hermes, or as they are also alternately called by the non-Hermetist group, the pillars of Enoch, you know, were said to have been standing since antediluvian times. Our priest in this particular work says that these pillars have been seen and studied by Pythagoras when he was in Egypt. And that this knowledge, uh, which was upon these pillars, was known to both Pythagoras and Plato, and that it was through them that it descended into the Greek side of Neoplatonism. And it was through the Egyptian uh, branch or side of the subject that it descended through the Hermetic mysteries. And that therefore, uh, in a sense, the two works had a great kinship with each other. The general tone of this book reminds us of uh, the opinion that uh, was presented by Solon after his return from Egypt. Uh, Solon, who was one of the first great lawgivers of Greece, and the man who reformed the great problem of boundaries and ownerships and land, and was the first to make impossible the enslavery of man in Greece for debt. He was a great liberal and a great leader. Solon, returning from Egypt after he had sought among the Egyptians 
uh, the information necessary to reform the Athenian law, Solon uh, observed an incident that had occurred to him uh, while he was in Egypt. He had been asking questions of one of the Egyptian priests, and suddenly the priest turned to him and shook his head very, very sadly, said, Oh, you Greeks, oh, you Greeks, why will you forever remain children? In other words, uh, perhaps it was... Um, a little bit of sophistry on the part of the Egyptians. We don't know, of course, every ancient nation believed its own culture was the best. But the Egyptians always regarded uh, the Greeks as sort of perpetual adolescents. They were never willing to acknowledge that the Greeks quite equaled them in penetration into the great mysteries of life. And in this particular work, Iamblichus, uh, if he is following an original document, as is indicated, uh, certainly picks up this particular problem. Because in the, the letter which is being answered by the priest was written by one of the Greek philosophers, and the priest, in answering it, nearly in every question and section, corrects the Greek. In other words, he does not agree with the Greek approach to the entire subject. Now, one of the interesting things about the section which is here, which deals with the subject of theurgy, is the principle involved. The book itself carries through on the subject of divination. In other words, the work deals theoretically and practically with the possibility of man receiving from the gods or from superior beings answers to mysteries, guidance, instruction, and whether it is possible for man with the aid of gods, or of powers, or of mysteries, or of secrets, to foretell the future, to know that which is to come, but most of all, <coughs> to advance to the state of theurgy, which in this work is said to be able to foretell the everlastingness. In other words, to foretell, as the priest explains, not what will happen, but what you will be when it happens. And the Egyptian points out that this is the most important mystery, because anything that will ever happen in the future to you can only happen because of what you are. Therefore, to merely project the future upon the basis of our present state is to, pro is to prophesy uncertainly because we are not able to know even what we may desire at a remote time. So a man saying, will I fulfill my desire at a certain future time? And the oracle says yes. The man knows not what his future desire will be. Therefore, he cannot tell in what detail or particular fulfillment will be attained. The individual by virtue of the fact that he is forever growing. His destiny and his fate is not due, as the Greek and Egyptian priest says, uh, to the mutations of the world, but rather to the state of the individual in the world. Because if he changes, 10,000 may fall upon the right hand and ten thousand upon the left hand, but the just man shall not be moved. Therefore, the degree of his own justice determines his own survival. And it is on this grounds uh, that the theurgic priest, the Egyptian, says that the great mystery of uh, prophecy or of divination is to, defy, is to divine our own core of consciousness at any time but this moment because this core is forever changing. Therefore, our likes and dislikes are forever changing. And uh, these uh, problems uh, concern a considerable part of this work. The work also explains the, the Neoplatonic concept of the urgy as a kind of divination by which man is able to invoke the knowledge of the mystery of truth, as Isis, uh, by her conjurations, 
uh, invoked the power of rain and took from him the secret word of divine authority. Uh, in order also to understand the, the work, I want to read just one or two paragraphs to give you, who may not read the book, uh, something of the spirit of it. Because, as has been noted in the case of Iamblichus, there are tremendous overtones in the spirit of the man himself. This, this spirit also shines through the entire concept of Neoplatonism. And therefore, from the introduction of the book itself, I'd like to call attention, not particularly to Iamblichus, but to the strange, wonderful, mystical, uh, and yet profoundly significant way in which these statements were made. They are quite different from nearly all other philosophical or sacred literature. They are almost unique. Now this is the definition in Neoplatonism of creation. And I'm just going to read about a paragraph to give you some concept of their idea and of the strangely subtle way in which they expressed it. According to this theology, therefore, from the immense principle of principles, in which all things causally subsist and exist, absorbed in superessential light and involved in unfathomable depths, a beauteous progeny of principles proceed, all largely partaking of the ineffable, all stamped with the occult characters of deity, all possessing an overflowing fullness of good. From these dazzling summits, these ineffable blossoms, these divine propagations, be life, intellect, soul, nature, and body depend. Monads suspended from unities, deified natures preceding, uh, proceeding from deities. Each of these monads, too, is the leader of a series which extends from itself to the last of things, and which, while it pre proceeds from, at the same time abides in and returns to its leader. And all these principles and all their progeny are finally centered and rooted by their summits in the first great all-comprehending one. Thus all beings proceed from and are comprehended in the first being. All intellects emanate from the one first intellect. All souls from the one first soul. All natures blossom from one first nature, and all bodies proceed from the vital and luminous body of the world. And lastly, all these great monads are comprehended in the first one, from which they and all their depending series are unfolded into light. Hence this first one is truly the unity of unities, the monad of monads, the principle of principles, the God of gods, one and all things, yet one which is prior to all. I think that is as near, probably the most complete summary of the doctrine that we can find in the Neoplatonic literature. It uh, also gives us something now of the spirit of this particular doctrine. Amplicus claims very definitely that a great part of this material is derived from the remnants and the fragments and the surviving instruments of the old Pythagorean system. And he points out very definitely in this concept what he calls the concept of unities, which uh, is uh, more or less unfolded in this definition. These unities as unfolding or descending blossoms suspended from unity. Iambicus explains through the Egyptian priest, or perhaps it is the priest himself explaining, we probably will never know, uh, that all things proceeding from unity must forever bear within themselves 
the seed of unity. That unity itself stands as what, with what Bene calls the signatura rerum, the great seal of likeness. And that nothing can proceed from unity that is not itself a unity. Therefore, according to this system, all beings proceeding from primordial being partake inwardly and eternally of unity, and likewise subsist in and forever remain within the body of all circumscribing essential unity. Uh, also, Iamblichus tells us that the proper and least, rather with the most proper and least erroneous definition of the unity of unities, the principle of principles, is that it is the one and the good. It is the one because by unity man bestows the, the supreme sense of his own power to bestow honor as his own consciousness and his own nature instinctively perceives the oneness to be the most honorable, to be the most ancient, to be the most inevitable. And by oneness or unity, he bestows the attribute or title of totality. Therefore, totality as one is the supreme being. The Egyptian then says that the term the good is peculiarly appropriate also inasmuch as it is the inevitable and natural instinct of all creatures to desire the good, uh, to seek the good, and uh, gradually through the unfolding faculties and powers which they gradually come to possess to serve the good, uh, to demand or require the life of virtue and to honor the gods by the performance of that which is good. Therefore, by the one uh, is expressed the nature and root of being and by the good, the eternal, everlasting, never-ceasing yearning of all life for the experience of that which is its own ultimate, the eternal subsistence within the substance of the good. That all things that may be, may be good. That man may be in himself good, and through his own goodness make good the world. And that when he achieves these ends, he is at the same time stating his highest religious conviction concerning the one because he instinctively assumes that the great desire of the one as expressed through creation is for the realization, manifestation, and total fullness of the good. Therefore, the one moving into activity in any form moves by virtue, and that all the works of the one are good, and all the creations of the one are in themselves good, and that therefore the gradual revelation of good is the final revealing of the one in all the states of human society. Uh, this also brings us to another point uh, which I would like to also read, and this will be the only uh, reading we'll do, but I want to bring this example out because it points up another situation that I mentioned. Namely, that the Egyptians uh, were a little inclined to regard the Greeks as inadequate in their philosophical approach to things. Now, in a book of this kind, it is quite possible that the author intentionally enters a, mis a mistaken concept in order to sustain the explanation. In other words, he may cause the uh, student in the writing to make a comparatively foolish question in order that the scholar, the wise man, the sage, may have an opportunity to unfold the correct answer. It's a, it's a method in dialogue which is frequently used in classical writings, because if the question is always complete and perfect, there is usually no need for the answer. A completely perfect question is the complete answer of itself. Therefore, 
that there has to be something wrong in the statement or it does not lead uh, to a discourse or dialogue. So in the dialectical and dialogic form, uh, this is common. Now, in the Egyptian priests answering the Greek, we have an interesting point here, which also uh, sustains one of the abstractions of this point. In the first place, therefore, you say, the Egyptian is now answering the question, of, presumably, uh, of Porphyry. You say, it must be granted that there are gods. This is the statement which the Greek makes. The Egyptian answers this way. Thus to speak, however, is not right on this subject. For an innate knowledge of the gods is coexistent with our very essence. And this knowledge is superior to all judgment and deliberate choice, and subsists prior to reason and demonstration. It is also co-united co from the beginning with its proper cause, and is consubsistent with the essential tendency of the soul to the good. If indeed it be requisite to speak the truth, the contact with divinity is not knowledge. For knowledge is in a certain respect separated from its object by a state of otherness. This is a, a very uh, subtle point. But prior to the knowledge, which as one thing knows another thing, is the uniform connection with divinity, and which is suspended from the gods, is spontaneous and inseparable from them. Hence it is not proper to grant this, as it might not be granted, nor to admit it as ambiguous, for it is always uniquely established in energy, nor are we worthy to explore it, as if we had sufficient authority to approve or reject it. For we are comprehended in it, or rather we are filled by it, and we possess that very thing which we are, or by which our essence is characterized in the knowing of the gods. Therefore he tells us in this, uh, which is his, a part of his introduction to theurgy, that the theurgical art is the transcendence by the individual or by the truth seeker of that knowledge by which he affirms or rejects any matters relating to the divine. In other words, I don't mean that he conforms necessarily to an opinion, but rather that he does not approach the nature of the eternal or being, as, uh, uh, as Iamblichus calls it, as something worthy of contemplation or something which can be contemplated by another thing separate from itself. The Egyptian here is pointing out that in this subject, therefore, man depends upon the use of a power within himself, which is not his own power, but the power of unity or divine cause, eternally subsistent within his own nature. Therefore, that man can only apperceive the true nature of being by virtue of the quality or power of that being in him, and not by any power or nature, attribute, or faculty of his own. This is the foundation of theurgy, as it is taught in Neoplatonism, that the individual can never produce a vehicle of consciousness by which he is capable of transcending the limitations of this otherness, which is the state of his own approach to, estimation of, or reflection upon, reality or truth as something separate or distinct. He is therefore warned in the beginning of the theurgical arts which were the uh, highest uh, levels 
of the Neoplatonic mystery, that to contemplate is to proceed to the point in which we may see things as pictures, or as likenesses, or as representations, and that these likenesses and representations, like great art, great music, or any other magnificent aesthetic expression, may stimulate us, may enthrall us, uh, may give great joy and beauty to us, may ennoble us, and may give us the strength and security for further achievement, but in themselves they cannot be considered as the direct manifestations of the supreme power. Inasmuch as that which can be contemplated apart from man implies the existence within the experience of man of a state of disunity, man and the object of his quest are two, and truth is one. Therefore, the Neoplatonists maintain that as long as the observer observes, as long as the knower knows, as long as the thinker thinks, there must be otherness. And therefore, that the supreme work, uh, which they believe to have been the original uh, doctrine or concept of the Greek mysteries, was that man must first overcome otherness. Or, as they would have said it, perhaps more wisely, that this overcoming of otherness is not the first, but the last. It is the most difficult and the most abstract and mysterious of the theurgical practices. This, of course, consummated or crowned the entire Neoplatonic system, and all of their other disciplines, as Porphyry and uh, Plotinus also tell us, that all other disciplines were to prepare the individual uh, to approach the mysterious state of non-otherness. Here, of course, we have had uh, reason uh, to liken certain of these concepts to the Eastern systems, uh, to Buddhism with its nirvana, to the Vedanta or Yoga with their samadhi and other similar states. But in the Neoplatonic system, it is a little bit different. The Neoplatonists did not uh, seek identification with eternity through the rejection of life. He did not seek uh, to destroy uh, the individual. He did not seek to prevent the natural growth of the intellect or the unfoldment of any attribute which man may have inherited uh, from what the, our Egyptian would call the secondary gods. Other than that, the uh, Neoplatonists made great stress and emphasis upon the, the individual achieving what they would term the philosophic life through the gradual, sequential transcendence of limitation. In other words, uh, the great initiation rite was growth itself. And growth represented the individual's achieving and transcending, never evading or avoiding or seeking uh, to escape. That there was no way through any problem in the long course of human experience except straight through. That the individual had to always have victory. For failing in victory, he failed in release. Any problem that is not completely solved must remain a terrible uncertainty in the consciousness of the individual, and he will therefore face it again and again, not because the problem necessarily is so great, but because his own strength is not great enough. Thus, in the uh, Neoplatonic system, man grew by exhausting the limitations imposed by every level of existence. This is precisely the burden of the divine Pymander or the Shepherd of Hermes, in which the individual, the initiate seeking the mysteries, ascends through the orbits of the seven planets, and at each of these orbits he transcends or solves the mystery of that orbit. And so finally he attains to the Empyreum and passes through the mysterious little door in heaven 
and comes before the throne of the Great One above the great crystalline sea, as described in the book of Revelation. A very large part of that magnificent scene in Revelation is almost word for word from the Hermetic books. In the um, Neoplatonic concept, therefore, we have the gradual experience of the individual moving from the sense of separateness or the sense of aloneness toward the sense of identity. To the uh, Egyptian who writes this book, aloneness is, this, is the acknowledgement of the acceptance of diversity. The more completely the individual believes in many, the more completely he is capable of isolation. If he believes in ten or a hundred or a thousand, he is one of them. And they may all exist around him, and they may all press in upon him. Therefore, aloneness is the statement of the acceptance of the even or divided number the representation of the individual's inability to recognize unity. And uh, the Egyptian also points out that from the earliest points of man's existence, he has been moving from a savage isolation toward a gradual integration of a social structure in which he no longer experiences aloneness. Thus, in the archetype or in the divine patterns, even as the gods in their own motions move again towards the victory of re-identification, so man in his great migration through life is forever moving away from separateness and towards the increasing recognition of wholenesses. Um, Iamblichus tells us uh, that these unities uh, which represent the roots or seeds which flow from or descend from primordial unity, that these unities are innumerable, and that man conquering diversity always does so by the discovery or the experience of some kind of unity. And he also, and later uh, Proclus points out to us, that every experience of a unity is an illumination. In other words, the moment the individual sees the bridges between separate things, he begins to have the theurgic vision to some degree, because theurgy is not merely a consummation in itself. It is a gradually unfolding, growing power of apperception by which certain things, not now obvious, become more and more continuously apparent to the consciousness. Therefore, a unity uh, or the experience of the discovery of monads or entities may exist on any level. One of the old philosophers pointed out the fact that when a man takes a piece of wood, puts three legs under it, and makes a stool, that this individual has made a unity out of diversity. He has built a unity, and that all building is the bringing of things together even as all destruction is the separation of things. Now, actually, the uh, Neoplatonists did not believe in a principle of destruction. They believed that disintegration always occurs, that reintegration may follow on a higher level. But they did recognize that things may fall apart. And they also considered that things which fall apart pass from a state of growth into a state of decay. So that something that becomes decadent, that falls apart, that relapses, that uh, no longer hangs together, that no longer has integration and purpose, this inevitably leads to decay and the final disintegration of parts. So that uh, unity may be experienced in, any, in many levels of unity. For example, in art, uh, we may have a unity of a small group of artists with a single purpose, perhaps a half dozen of them, come together for some particular project, thus forming an entity or an entirety. And following, as he expresses it, one of the uh, older doctrines of Pythagoras, uh, Iamblichus points out that the moment a group of divided 
elements are restored to a unity, they are ensouled by a power. And that this ensouling power is derived from the numerical archetype of the universe. And that every number that is conceivable to man consists of two things, a monadal number or a numeration, and an ordinary number or the sequences that we know. Therefore, for instance, the number 60 is either a unit, 60, or else it is 61s, the infinite diversity of its own number. In the uh, grouping, uh, as he expla explains it, therefore, the experience of unification releases archetype which exists in space. For every numeration or compound composed of the potential of numbers, abides also in its own state as a unity. The recognition of the ten parts is not the experience of ten. And the experience of the oneness of ten is achieved in the life of man, according to Iamblichus, through the voluntary cooperation of human beings who discover the old adage, in union there is strength. And that uh, these unions uh, create a oneness. When six men are of one mind, there is a oneness. And this oneness is an archetypal entity. And according to the Chaldeans, these archetypal numerical entities are gods. Or, if we wish to look at it otherwise, uh, they um, enable through a new body compound to achieve a release of the common strength of the group. So in the uh, story, uh, as uh, Iamblichus expresses it, there are two ways of approaching this mystery. One is to recognize the possibility of achieving union in the otherwise, or in the otherness. In other words, that we may take blocks on a table and arrange them. We may take ten tubes of paint and paint one picture with them. This picture is a unity. And this unity is really the instrument of an idea. And in that condition, or in that instance, man himself as the painter is the archetypal pressure that is released only through the necessary media or instruments. But uh, the Greek and the Neoplatonists emphasize that these unities, which are so important, may be intellectually known in the otherness, but can never be experienced in the otherness. The only experience of them lies when this entire process of coordinating parts, or the restoring of these divergent enumerations, that it must all occur within the individual, not within the world around him. He must experience the unity. And the primary experience arises from the unification of the diversity of his own parts. And that just as surely as uh, evolution must bring him to the gradual unfoldment of his potentials, this law operates through the restoration of unities throughout his body, throughout his emotions, throughout his soul, throughout his mind, throughout his consciousness. And the individual, as uh, the Egyptian in this work says, is dissimilar in his present state, due principally to the fact that he is disunited within his own nature. And that which is in itself divided cannot, in that state, have the experience of being united. It must attain to this experience. It must achieve it. And, of course, in the ancient rituals, the uh, story of initiation, uh, as uh, contained in the Egyptian mysteries to which the old priest refers, was a series of pageantries, dramas, or symbols to impress this upon the neophyte or the candidate. Not so much by things said as by things seen or heard not so much by counsel, but by mood, by the tremendous stimulation of some internal release of the individual, and a release that is made possible or made suitable by an experience. 
Uh, therefore, the initiation ritual was totally different from instruction because in the initiation there was an experience, a participation. There was not this mysterious interval of otherness. The candidate was actually doing these things himself. He was not hearing about them. And uh, this is also involved in the mudras of Indian religion, because the hand postures, although they are symbolical and in themselves apparently trivial, represent the tremendous difference between learning, listening, reading, and even the simplest gesture of the hand in the actual act of doing. The transformation of a symbol into a living circumstance by the bestowal of internal energy. In this uh, uh, st uh, story, therefore, in the development of their le level of theurgy, the Neoplatonists emphasize that uh, the great art, the mysterious uh, wisdom revelation which they sought, was not one thing, not one attainable mystery, but was a series of reversals of the involutionary processes by which greater and greater separateness uh, became the burden of human life, and that by reversing this process, man gradually united the various elements and powers of his own nature, uh, as uh, Porphyry and also Sallust, and to a degree the Emperor Julian points out, uh, that there is as yet no unity in man's sensory perceptions themselves. The eye sees with one purpose, the ear hears with another. Man cannot control his own faculties. He cannot focus them upon a one purposeness. Therefore, it is perhaps a difficult but necessary thing for him to learn that all of these sensory perceptions are the servants and instruments of an apperceptive power superior to themselves. For as uh, Plotinus points out, unity is always achieved upon a level superior to the diversity. In order to bring things together, in order to circumscribe or bring things within pattern, the individual must transcend their separateness and from a superior state of awareness gather them in. He cannot gather them in directly upon the level of the confusion in which they are separated. This, uh, this power to gather them in depends therefore upon a degree of theurgical insight that is greater than the diversity at any given moment. To achieve this theurgical insight Rationality is not invoked, uh, nor is knowledge regarded as uh, the solution. The solution is always through the experience of the superior. Consequently, the contemplative or mystical disciplines of Neoplatonism begin to uh, assert themselves. The discipline is, uh, to, uh, to use our words, more simple words, almost, is to relax into the acceptance of the real. Recognizing that diversity is essentially a state of knowing or a state of not knowing. That diversity for man is a condition arising from his own lack of insight. The primary problem is not uh, that he shall increase in insight, but that he shall no longer uh, increase in failure of insight. In other words, it is not so much in this concept that he grows as that he ceases to resist growth. Not so much that he knows more, but rather that he begins to experience that which is eternally available in knowing. Uh, these terms, even as the uh, old books themselves tell us, very soon become exceedingly complicated, inasmuch as the appropriate name for an experience uh, cannot be found. Once it is experienced, it needs no name, and when it is not experienced, it is useless to name it. Consequently, the problem of the true degree of 
uh, experience can only be approximated intellectually. And the intellectual approximation is not the attainment of it. The attainment of it lies in the theurgical concept that it must be lived. It must uh, completely and totally uh, possess the being. And the, pa the power of man to possess this insight lies not essentially in himself, but in the archetypal eternity of oneness, which is at the root of him and within which he exists. Therefore, man's eternal pattern of growth arises from the inevitable impulse of diversity towards its own reunion. And man is on a flowing universal stream that is moving inevitably in this direction. If man resists this motion, he is miserable, he is sick, he is disordered. If great collective parts of mankind resist this motion, they are inevitably destroyed thereby or at least <coughs> frustrated and injured. It is therefore the resistance to that which is true or real, which is regarded as the greatest handicap. And in the uh, theurgical part of this mystery, the disciple is taught that if he does not prevent unity, he will experience it. Perhaps that is the nearest way in which I can put it into the words uh, of the original concept as it is given. If the individual does not stand in the way of experience, but is simply quietly receptive of reality, the archetypes move through him. He experiences them, he knows them, because they are of himself. And as in the paragraph which I read, he no longer takes certain things for granted, or presumes, or assumes, or believes. These things move through him when he does not prevent their motion. In our world, however, we are inclined to prevent motions, and it was not so different in the days of Socrates, because the individual, in order to not resent or prevent motion, has to have a certain attitude toward the problem of growth. This attitude lies in the recognition that there is no obstacle but the self, and that all other so-called obstacles are excuses. That the emotion of the individual toward totality <coughs> is a completely internal and eternal motion. That it need not be conferred by one upon another because it is equally present in all things. And as the Egyptian tells us a little later, the stamp of universal or divine being as totality is present in everything from the greatest to the least throughout space. That there is no being, no creature, no existence, which in its essential nature does not possess unity. And in possessing unity, possesses the potential of experiencing total existence. Therefore, the obstacle lies not uh, in the inability of the individual to receive instruction, or the inaptitude of the times, or the inconsistency of surrounding circumstances, because unity is present, and its total seal and stamp in everything that exists, from the greatest sun in space to the most minute molecule or ion dancing in a ray of light or energy. These are all totalities, and the totality of each is God, and the totality of the sum is God, and God is the totality of totalities, as these Chal the Chaldean oracles uh, are supposed to have said. In this concept, then, uh, the Neoplatonists held that theurgy was the attainment of that which is the inevitable state of man, some achieving it uh, through vigorous attempt, others uh, through absolute self-forgetfulness in the service of other human beings, others less thoughtful 
having it slowly thrust upon them by the inevitable vicissitudes of existence. But whether by intent or by circumstance, uh, whether through a tremendous adoration of the divine, or an eternal and complete dedication to the human need, the individual is moving constantly toward totality through every moment and instant of self-forgetfulness. The moment he remembers himself, he's lost, as far as the total experience of the urge is concerned. The moment he is not aware of himself, he begins to depreciate or depress the otherness because he cannot be hyperly aware of self unless he believes there is something else beside himself. Self is a division. To believe in self is also to recognize isolation from other selves because self cannot be one and total in equal degree at the same time. So in the uh, Neoplatonic concept, the purpose of self-forgetfulness is represented as the simple means of removing active uh, attitudes which deprive the individual of the immediate apperception of the life moving through him and the archetypes within him. Now these uh, teachers also fully realize that there is a difference in the attainable degree of this total experience of unity possible to the individual at a given time. They believe firmly, this book states without equivocation, that this total experience is ultimately available to every creature that exists and is its proper destiny. But the, the Neoplatonists affirm that this total experience would not be possible on the same level at a given time in an imperfect and incomplete world to all persons, but that this is in itself no importance, inasmuch as in each instance the experience of unity is a superior experience to the present, and the person of comparatively un cultured attainments, who discovers the next superior state of unity in himself, has as great and thrilling an experience as the great sage who may, uh, may experience a much vaster uh, consciousness in this subject. It is all growth, all of this growth is toward totality. And as there are young children who must be taught one thing and older children who must be taught something else, so there are in the world persons, all of whom must react according to their potentials as the, they are now manifested. But each one of these is capable daily, yearly, and through life uh, to have a series of unfoldings of unity according to his capacity and his knowledge. The carpenter, the shipbuilder, the clerk, uh, the professional man, all of these individuals are capable of gradually unfolding sense of oneness, of identity. Perhaps the physician may first of all begin to recognize a certain unity between himself and the great need of a suffering mankind. He then approaches his subject no longer merely as a physician making a living, but the experience of the service of a great unity, a concept of identity, a oneness, which may be termed health, which may be termed the service of a principle or of a law. And if the physician actually is sincere and is devoted to his cause, the practice of his profession and his faithful service of others will give him an experience of divine unity through the god Asclepius, which is the monad of God as healing and of health. Therefore he discovers the healing power of the archetypal law through his own ministry. Through whatever we do, we release some indication of the patterns 
or the great uh, mathematical radiant blossoms described by Plotinus, suspended in being, the wonderful geometric snowflakes of inflexible and inevitable law, which are forever the, per, per, uh, pressing themselves upon creation. To experience these laws, to know them not by the mind, but through a living in them and with them, a gradual possession by them, so that the unity becomes the total or wholeness of the person. So we have Plotinus saying also that each individual, as he grows, presents a sequence of totalities, which is himself. And it is this thing he calls himself that bears witness to the totality he has attained. Because whatever real growth he achieves is not upon himself, toward himself, or for himself, but is himself as part of the unity of the divine power or monad which is at the root of his own existence. Thus in all of these procedures, the urgy, as it was taught by the Neoplatonists, comprehends the uh, gradual elimination of otherness and the gradual acceptance of an identity with this gradually unfolding reality. Now these people lived in times and under circumstances in which world and world's situations were contrary uh, to their deepest and dearest convictions. Thus perhaps we may see the reason for the tremendous emphasis which they placed upon a certain of these principles. An emphasis which we find again, of course, in Sallust, in the gods and the world, and in the hymn of the Emperor Julian to the mother of the gods. Uh, in, the, in these great uh, works, uh, these Neoplatonists uh, pointed out conclusively uh, the transcendent importance of this theurgical mystery, inasmuch as no tyranny of a decadent state could in this way touch uh, the person who possessed the true understanding and the true motives. That it did not require any assistance other than the complete and abiding faith of the individual in the total aspect of universal good. That it was a complete faith in the immutability and inevitability of archetypes that was the final and complete uh, defender and sustainer of the inward life. Either the inward life is sustained by absolute law or it is not. And the Neoplatonists insisted that it was. Therefore, those who break the law, nationally or individually, must ultimately uh, meet a reward or a compensation suitable to their needs, a punishment which is in itself a lesson and therefore contributes to the ultimate release of the reality through them. But the decadence of worlds and the collapse of cultures could not touch the great archetypes, because these archetypes do not depend upon any human institution for their manifestation. They depend only upon the absolute release, like a blinding flash of eternal radiance, the absolute release of total being through total creation. And that this total creation is gradually achieving this end. Uh, reading one time uh, one of the uh, dialogues of Julian, I happened to go to a motion picture show <laughs> where they have slowed down the growth of a flower. Or rather, I guess in this case, they speeded it up. In any way, it made it seem as though the flower moved. Because they really, they uh, made the camera, they slowed down the camera, and in that way made the film appear to transform the plant into an animate thing. In other words, they took a single frame only so many minutes or maybe so many hours apart. And then when the sequence was run, it seemed as though the flower opened with a burst of light. And I couldn't help but think of Julian's meditation uh, relating to the problem of the world in which he says, or points out, that at any given time, under any given circumstance, there appears to be no motion toward this wholeness.
<coughs> that there is no appreciable time in which we can say this is the day of great rejoicing. That each generation, each day seems to pass uh, and the great plan is neglected and ignored and the otherness prevails. But he also points out that in the, in the great other dimensions of human consciousness, this is not true. And that uh, like the changing the rate of the camera suddenly transforms a very slow process into an immediate apparent process. So actually this tremendous motion is going on, but it is so slow that we do not notice it. But in the great unfoldment of the blaze of eternity itself, this motion is probably in reality, far more rapid than we realize. This bursting through of totality, the complete conquest of otherness by uh, reality itself, was to these people, these philosophers, uh, the condition most greatly to be desired. And in the practice of theurgy, as we have said, they taught certain uh, cathartic disciplines, disciplines of purification, disciplines of instruction. They believed in teacher-student relationship, not because the teacher was wise or the, uh, the student was foolish, but because of an experience, that the experience of relationship, the man individual who could learn to follow the teacher could sometime learn to obey God. And the teacher did not claim to be God or to hold any ancient or sacred prerogatives, but the individual who cannot obey can never lead successfully or securely. So all through their disciplines they set up patterns, not for the sake of forms, but for the sake of enriching, enriching or strengthening the inner character and attribute of the individual. And they went on from these disciplines of purification to disciplines of meditation and enlightenment, uh, seeking always the uh, highest good as it was attainable to them. Uh, one uh, modern writer who was not particularly uh, favorable to these older philosophers, as is often the case, however, did summarize one statement not long ago when he said, whatever we may say or think, we cannot question the magnificent ethics uh, promulgated and taught by these people, an ethics which probably is one of the highest in the history of philosophy, because these people made so much of the fact in fact, their whole philosophy was suspended from the one fact that philosophy was not a way of thinking. Philosophy was not an accumulation of knowledge. Philosophy was an experience of life. So the quotation, make philosophy thy life. Not the subject of analysis or concentration or something of that kind alone. The ethical structure of the Neoplatonists, therefore, uh, is of some ad, uh, advantage to us to know exactly how uh, they proceeded in their general contemplation. They held on the religious level that the greatest possible good was to discover the oneness, the complete indivisible wholeness of all human religion. That all religions, great and lesser, enlightened and unenlightened, represented degrees of the human quest for totality, for wholeness, uh, for escape from otherness into the sphere of reality. Therefore, their absolute patience with all religion, and at the same time, their very sincere and definite desire uh, to assist the release of the highest ethical and moral principles within these uh, different religious groups. As Plotinus says, they held philosophy uh, to be a great discipline of the mind, by which the mind could be brought to that realization of the reality of universals that they might, or the mind itself, might then abide in perfect childlike faith in the realities of eternity. Like Socrates and Plato, therefore, the mind prepared the individual for the perfect faith, hope, and love, because it proved to him the kind of a world in which he lived, and enabled him to trust his eternal destiny without hastation, without reservation, without mental limitation, to the infinite keeping of the infinite good. Of uh, morality, their doctrines would be as high as any that we have today. And for their general code, 
They were greatly indebted to the great uh, Egyptian negative confession of faith, uh, which they were uh, uh, able to contact, presumably, through the Hermetic Mysteries. And, of course, the, negative Egypt the Egyptian negative confession of faith is probably the greatest moral document on earth. It is a document so incredible uh, that we wonder that the Egyptian could accept it or even formulate it under oath because it is a type of thing that would be almost impossible for modern man to live up to. And yet it was not only inscribed in the mortuary rites, but because these rites were of the highest significance, uh, the individual, uh, in order to escape the implications of this, would have to stand prepared to perjure himself in the afterlife before God. And it is a little difficult to imagine that he would dare, under the existing state of his religion, to assume such a thing. It is not often that we see a complete statement of this as we find it in the early Hermetic works, but uh, therefore the original contains over 300 sections and constitutes an incredible moral code. But I remember three or four uh, thoughts in connection with it which were moved into Neoplatonism to become the basis of what they call the philosophic life. For as uh, I believe, if I can correct, it was Proclus who said, philosophy is nothing more than doing good. And then he adds, and to do good exhausts the power of philosophy. Because everyone in the world desires to do good, but very few know how. But in any event, the negative confession of faith includes such statements as the person standing before the great God and with all the gods of the balance before him, surrounded by the rulers of the quick and the dead, in the great hall of Amentet, and the soul of the deceased addressing Osiris of the double empire, plumed and robed. The soul says, Never during my earthly life did I say an unkind word about any person. Never in my life. Did I bring injury to the living or the dead? Never did I covet that which was not my own. Never did I raise my voice against my friend or my enemy. Now, if you go through 300 clauses of that caliber, <laughs> it must have been a little difficult to get into a mentet. <laughs> now, of course, we can say that nobody ever lived that way and that such a code is inconceivable. Granted, the Egyptian did not. But Plotinus and the Neoplatonists would point out a very simple thing. It was that power which was without otherness that made him dream and hope that he could. In other words, this code came from the eternal root. It came from something perhaps so great within himself that he could not even live it. He could never really transcend his own frailties to that degree. But it was this root beyond otherness that made him hope or dream that such virtues could be, or even to recognize such conduct as a virtue, because all men have not. It was also this root within him which made him dream of a time to come in which such a code could be real and men could live this way. So it was, as Plotinus points out, proof that the supreme preceptor, the grand hierophant of all mysteries, the teacher of teachers, lies in the total being of the individual himself. That in proper need, in proper humility, in proper grace of spirit, man becoming still, and learning through stillness to know, could bridge the mysterious otherness and find the eternal root and core of all good, all beauty, and all truth locked within his own soul. And that this great road past the otherness was the road of contrition, of dedication, of devotion, service, and love. These things uh, were greatly known by these people. 
And I suppose there is no group of philosophy in the Western world that made as heavy an emphasis upon human regard, friendship, affection, love, service, as this Neoplatonic school. It, to them, it was the, one of the essential disciplines of their religion. Uh, something not to be discussed, not necessarily to be advised, not even to be advocated, but simply, naturally, and without reservation to be applied. Not to be considered as a virtue, for Plotinus says definitely that man's growth is not to be considered as a virtue, but as the simple expression of an eternal necessity within himself. Man is not to be complimented because he grows, because growth is his natural way. And it is when he does not grow that he should be distinguished as in some way different and inferior to the order of life to which he belongs. Therefore his growth is his fulfillment, his natural and reasonable course of action. And on this ground uh, he is here to fulfill, uh, to develop and to perfect himself. Plotinus says that during his lifetime he was on six occasions elevated into theurgic identity with a blessed being. He tells us that this particular mystery is not to be explained, but that during these exaltations of consciousness, he was able to experience fully the complete meaninglessness of himself. That he was able to discover and experience uh, that truly, he was a word spoken by an infinite power, that in himself he was nothing, but that the great God in him did the work, and that in this relationship he was not only the willing hand, the willing servant, but that it was not even a servitude, because it was a realization of an identity that was so transcendent, so complete, and so immeasurable, that he was nothing and all, that he was not superior to the least nor inferior to the greatest, that he was totally alike, and that there was no longer any interval between himself and that which was infinitely less or infinitely great. Now, the degree of the exact enlightenment we do not know, but we know that it became the foundation of the entire theurgical art, which was to achieve the experience so that nothing is great nor small, but all things are true. And in their being true, they are not truth in the sense of fact. They are truth in the sense of radiant living being. For to the, all these ancients of this school, every reality was a radiant living archetype, not a fact, but a magnificent blazing entity, a tremendous mathematical formula in soul by a divine power. And the perfection of the formula called that power by an enchantment, and that which is built in a certain pattern calls to itself the soul that is to inhabit it, like the urns that were fashioned by Omar the tent maker, each of which spoke with a voice according to its own nature. So in the uh, Neoplatonic concept we find this uh, sense of illumination as being identity with the least and the greatest, without interval or difference. Uh, Plotinus pointed out that these experiences for man uh, for the average man, can last only for a few seconds, because beyond that point, the tremendous and incredible bewilderment, the incredible uh, radiance, would be more than the human personality can endure. Therefore, for a second, this tremendous blaze is released like baby's lightning flash, and then the curtain falls again and the individual lives once more in the peculiar uncertainties of the mortal sphere. But these experiences of that which is beyond otherness result in the sudden recognition that we are everything, and everything is us. There is no interval, there is no difference, there is no time. There is simply the incredible ability to experience 
the entire impact of creation as a mystery of the eternal will and the eternal love. These things then made the peculiar school that flourished in this sad and dismal transition period, that it brought with it a tremendous strength of inner conviction. We know that it had a short span of existence, we also know, for we know that after the death of Theon of Alexandria, uh, Hypatia took the chair of philosophy in the Neoplatonic Academy and was later assassinated. The murder of Hypatia closed the Alexandrian school. The death of Proclus probably approximately terminated the school in Athens, because after that time his disciples were scattered uh, and forced to flee into other lands. Uh, in Rome, uh, the school practically ended with the death of Plotinus. So the uh, Neoplatonic school did not live long in its strange, mysterious effort uh, to ex explain chaos. And the chaos of the Roman Empire, the chaos of Egypt and of Greece, by discovering, by a valiant extension of inward life, the immense reality which would justify chaos and would make it ultimately the instrument and servant of the great ordering power of an eternal good. These philosophers uh, left their mark upon history. Uh, their school of thought descended and has survived. We know, for example, the important part they played in the great statutes of St. Augustine. We know furthermore that they uh, were tremendously powerful in, sh in shaping the whole great theological system of, time of Thomas Aquinas. We know that they came on down through practically all the systems of idealistic philosophy, uh, all the way down to our own Emerson. Uh, nearly all mystics of the uh, medieval uh, Christian period, both Catholic and Protestant, were by nature and by, in many cases, by pronouncement, Neoplatonists. Uh, they were able to be this because the Church did not deny them that right. It did not hold up this one system to ridicule or uh, general uh, reputation. Uh, it was acknowledged and occurs again and again. In the Eastern Church, uh, the mysterious, the mystical divinity of Dionysus Areopagitus dominated the entire Eastern Church and became part of the tradition which descended with St. Chrysostom. In the West, we have other equal mystics some of the more famous, of course, St. Buenaventura, St. Francis de Assis, and others, all of whom carried the same mystical divinity concept with them, and it is still essentially a part of church dogma. Thus, the, uh, the influence of the situation uh, is reflected, perhaps, in the orders of penance, in some of the monastic orders of early Christianity, because of the effort uh, to escape otherness, and to lay a foundation for crossing the interval between human limitation and universal and eternal life. And all of these systems are uh, related in this uh, transition. Uh, we know, for instance, that Aquinas specifically and definitely mentions these other authors and his indebtedness to them. It is not theory, it is factually there. So that uh, we have a tremendous moral descent of Neoplatonism. And I think perhaps it can be also summarized in the approved definition of mysticism as it is known in the classical world and in the modern uh, world of uh, mature philosophical thinking. And that is mysticism is the belief or the conviction of the availability of the presence of the divine and that the individual seeking within himself and unselfishly and impersonally desirous and solicitous of inner instruction will receive it, and that this instruction is possible because of the omnipotence, omnipresent, and omniactivity of the divine power, which is without boundary or limitation, and is the supreme or tremendous unity, and is the tremendous archetypal impulse between, behind all creatures seeking wholeness and seeking to return again like Ulysses to their own far distant native land. And uh, as we go on with this series, we will also have a little time
to consider the wandering of Odysseus and other phases of this subject, the Porphyry's Cave of the Nymphs and Socrates, uh, uh, rather, um, uh, Apuleius on the God of Socrates. Then we will mention them in connection with other things. But I think perhaps this will give us uh, a little picture of the contribution that was made by the work of Iamblichus on the Mysteries, which is the basic concept on which we have been working tonight, the concept of theurgy. And we will pass on in the next instruction to another phase of Neoplatonic discipline.